Hello, Africa. You're welcome to ETV Ghana's African Women's Voices Show. This is the show that tackles issues pertaining to women as they contribute to national development. How have you been? I have been awesome, and I believe same for you too. And you know, as we always say on this show, no matter how it's been, you know, the past weeks, even this week, if it's not been so soothing, you just need to keep a positive spirit and believe that everything is just going to be all right. This too shall pass. As usual, I like to acknowledge those who are making this show come up to you every Wednesday at 8 p.m. A very big thank you to the person who has styled me up from up to down, and I greatly appreciate them all. For my hair, I was hair. Thank you so much. I wore is into any kind of hairstyle. If you want it in a wig style, if you want it to be a cap, do you want weavers? Do you want it in plaits or braids? She's ever ready, and she also goes to people's homes to offer them home services. So pick up her phone number right now on the base of your screen, and she's going to sort you out. And my dress is from Kubura Diamonds Boutique. Pick up her number as well. I am always spoiled for choice whenever I go to Kubura Diamonds Boutique because I just have a variety of items to pick up from. And my beads are always, always provided by Tony Crafts. Tony Crafts, thank you so much for always adorning me in this very beautiful African beads. Thank you so much. So on our social media pages earlier on this week, we told you that we're going to be focusing on diabetes. And we are looking at this particular one that affects women majorly, gestational diabetes. And uh, the interesting thing about it is that quite a number of women experience this during pregnancy, uh, but they never get to know about it until the time they've been told that they have it. And then they're trying to manage it and see what they can do. Tonight, we are trying to make you understand that there are better ways of managing it and also possibly avoiding it so you don't even get into it before you now have to start managing it, okay? So stay close to your phones or your laptops or your TV set, wherever you're watching us from. Please remember to send in your comments on Facebook because we are streaming live on our Facebook page at ETV Ghana. So before we go ahead, I'd like to introduce my guests as I always do. However, we'll get their profiles done and then we get to meet them up close and personal. So first to be introduced is Marbina Webb. I'd like you to hear her story. Mrs. Marbina Webb is the Managing Director for Brighter Purpose Group Limited, BPG, a financial and management consulting firm in Tema. One of BPG's more recent engagements has been to lead the U.S. manufacturer of the Splendor brand of sweeteners into the sub-Saharan African market for people seeking an alternative solution to sugar. Due to her history with gestational diabetes, Mabna has been engaging in diabetes awareness creation and advocacy as a CSR initiative through her foundation to champion diabetes awareness initiatives and courses. So ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Mrs. Marbina Webb. Welcome to African Women's Voices Show. Thank you. Thank Great. you very much. So she's going to be speaking from the perspective of someone who is managing the situation and also was diagnosed with uh, the, the condition. So we get to hear from her how she felt about it and how she feels about it even as at now. See that right next to her is a dietitian who is not an, uh, an, a face that is not familiar to those of you who watch African Women's Voices Show. She has always been with us, and uh, I'll still like to introduce her as usual. So let's hear her story. Esther Obey Mensa is a registered dietitian who is passionate about nutrition advocacy, expert in weight loss management. She works with Bima Ghana and My Health Corp, a content creator and a YouTuber. Oh, 
opulent dietitian is always very straight to the point. <laughs> You're welcome once again to Thanks ETV Ghana's having... African Women's Voices Thanks Show. Thanks for having me once again. It's All been right. A while. Yeah, it's been a while, yeah. and I'm so happy to see you. Okay. okay, so let's get into the business of the day. We have an advocate seated here, and we have a dietitian who is going to also help us with managing the case of uh, gestational diabetes let's just get to know what this is all about what would you describe the condition to be um but uh, first and foremost a very good evening to everyone and a happy new year to everyone watching um gestation i think as you made mention earlier on not everyone is familiar with it they just know diabetes mm -hmm. which majority know type 1 diabetes type 2 but when it comes to gestation unless you get there before you get to being discovered. Usually it is predominant in pregnancy. And so someone may not be diabetic. However, during pregnancy, then they get being diagnosed of, being pregnant, of having the condition. So basically, gestation diabetes is just diabetes in pregnancy. Mm. That is just the whole, um, the mean basically. So if you have diabetes outside pregnancy, it's no more gestational diabetes. diabetes. But if you have it whilst or during pregnancy, then it's gestational diabetes. Basically, the buildup of sh your sugar level or the sugar in your blood buildup of it during pregnancy. Basically, that is gestational what it diabetes. What is, okay. Yeah. So this is diabetes in, during pregnancy, okay. So let's move over to the advocate. Mm -hmm. So uh, how did you get to know that you had the condition? Okay, so first of all, again, a good evening to your viewers and a very happy new year. I'm really glad to be here on mm -hmm. the show today. Um, I actually found out that I had gestational diabetes as a regular routine care during pregnancy. So it's something that um, is done during pregnancy between 24 and 28 weeks. So that's about, you know, around the six month to seven month mark of pregnancy. And what um, the doctors do is usually they would uh, perform a glucose tolerance test. Mm. And so what that is, is they give you a solution, a really sugary solution. First of all, you go, you report to your doctor's office, they draw your blood, your fasting blood sugar. So after, let's say, 10 p.m. the night before, you don't eat anything or drink anything till the morning. And then you, um, they draw your blood to see what your fasting blood sugar is. And then they give you this uh, glucose solution to drink. Mm -hmm. And after an hour, two hours, they draw your blood and they test it to see. And there's a threshold that mm -hmm. they go by. So if you, if you go above that threshold, then it's considered that you have failed the um, oral gl glucose test. And so then you are diagnosed with gestational diabetes. Oh, okay. So that's so that was when, the case. That's how I found you. out. Yes, that's how I found out. The first time it was it was kind of heartbreaking for me. In fact, mm -hmm. I really cried. It's like, okay, what mm -hmm. am I going to do? Mm -hmm. What am I going to eat? Mm -hmm. You know, that kind of thing. You know, but um, so they gave me a dietitian to guide me, you know, on how to eat and how to manage it and all of that. Yes. Wow, so, that's yeah. interesting. So was that in your first pregnancy that you had it or you've had it through all your pregnancies? That's a great question because my first pregnancy I was actually borderline. So I, was, I took the test and I was borderline. So I passed. Okay. But in hindsight, they should have probably you know, di diagnosed me with gestational diabetes. My subsequent pregnancy, so my second one was the first time I was diagnosed with um, gestational diabetes. And after that, every pregnancy after that, I was diagnosed with gestational diabetes. Wow, mm -hmm. wow, mm -hmm. you are really strong. <laughs> <laughs> You're strong. Yeah. So I'll be getting back to you. So let's come back to the dietitian. So now, if someone is diagnosed with this condition, yeah. how does it affect the person and how does it affect the baby? Yeah, um, I think as she made mention on earlier on, um, first of all, if they are being diagnosed, they get a bit traumatized, especially for those that haven't had the condition before pregnancy. So it takes um, a lot to psych them, to let them know that it can be resolved after pregnancy. Usually, during the pregnancy, it's well managed during pregnancy. It gets resolved, which you don't get being diagnosed after pregnancy. However, for those that are not controlled during pregnancy, um, due to life, lifestyle or due to some medications, they're not able to control it. Then after the pregnancy, then they continue to be diagnosed when they are being tested um, again for the condition. So during pregnancy, when you have this condition, um, it's not something that you need to just sit back and be unconcerned. It's an alarm. And, and first and foremost, we should know that during pregnancy, there are hormonal changes. And it's these hormonal changes that are responsible 
um, for this rise in the sugar levels. Uh, and so it's not something that you are expecting. However, the probability is high. And it poses the mother and the fetus at a higher risk. Um, first of all, for the mother, they, it predisposes them for um, preeclampsia or eclampsia, which is that has high blood pressure in uh, pregnancy, pregnancy as well. And so if you have, your blood sugar level rises during pregnancy, your chances of also having your blood pressure also rising is also very high, which is also another um, that condition, condition also. on its own that is also uh, arises for concern because these two, having them at the same time, it's, it's very serious. And so it raises your, your, your chances of getting this. And also, if you have uh, this, before we, we come to gestation now, some of the factors that also predispose if you are obese. And so during the uh, pregnancy, since you are obese, it means that it affects your metabolism. You have something we call uh, metabolic syndrome, which are some of the factors that predisposes the mother. So you have the preeclampsia. It also affects their intake. Because some of them have been told of this condition, it affects how they go about eating. They become too careful and mm -hmm. they, they tend to starve themselves, not even try to eat anything, so it affects your intake. By so doing, if you are obese, in a way, you may be safe, but if you are not and you are weight, you, they tend to lose weight instead of gaining the healthy weight during pregnancy. But when it comes to the fetus, fetus, the fetus also could um, have the chances that's in the outdoor stage, they could also have the chance of being obese and also have the chance of being diabetic as well. So the mm -hmm. child is also not safe. Um, they have, you have stages or uh, a particular stage in life where the, it predisposes the child if they also don't take their lifestyle seriously. However, coming back to the mother, there can be stillbirth. There can also be, um, uh, um, the pregnancy can spoil or there can be uh, that kind of, yes, most of the mis is that, thank you, miscarriages as well. So for those that are diagnosed earlier in the first trimester, however, it usually starts in the second and third trimester. That is when if you are safe. But if it happens to be diagnosed in the first trimester, the chances of losing the child is very high. So most mothers do do their checks even during the first trimester, even though during that time, probability of being diagnosed is not that much. But it's been, as she said, 28 days, the test is done in the second and third trimester. So you losing the child is very high. Still, but it's also another thing on its own, which is very deadly, which if not diagnosed early, even a mother can lose. Like, so it's a condition that is very, very of concern. Yeah. You see, from the way she's described it and <laughs> how serious it is, yeah. I would like to hear from Mabina exactly <laughs> how it felt for her. Did they really tell you all these things? Yes, yes. Okay. And actually, one of the things I would like to add is one of the main things that, especially during pregnancy, that you know is a concern mm -hmm. is the baby get can get really large, yeah. so that delivery becomes a problem. Exactly. You know, they get really large, especially in the upper body. Yeah. You know what doctors call macrosomia, macrosomia and so during yeah. delivery, it it can be really complicated. And you know, if care is not taken, and you're you know, if it's it's not a cesarean bed, then you can really go into complications where you can lose the baby yeah. and all of that. And when the baby is born also the baby can actually have low blood sugar yeah. so all the high blood sugar in the mother's blood actually causes the baby if they are born and care is not taken the baby can have low, low blood, blood sugar, sugar and that can kill the baby okay. so mm. it's a it's a big concern and of course once you are diagnosed the information is given to you to you know know everything that um, can possibly happen so that you take it seriously yeah. and you know take the management of it seriously as well Yes. All right. Yes. I'll go for a quick commercial break. But when we return, I'd like to find out from Mabina how she was able to walk through this process until her delivery right after this break. And you're welcome back to ETV Ghana's African Women's Voices show. If you just joined us, well, let me just give you a brief update as to how far we've gone into the show. You've not missed much, okay? We have described gestational diabetes and we have understood that it's a diabetic condition that occurs during pregnancy. And this poses a threat to both baby and mom. Mom is, is very likely to actually lose the baby or even lose her own life because it exposes her to preeclampsia, which is another condition that is complicated in pregnancy. And that means uh, the mother 
has developed high blood pressure you know, within her pregnancy. So you can imagine a pregnant woman who has got high sugar and also has got high blood pressure. That's a lot of stress on her side already and how it could also affect the baby. We've been made to understand that the baby could become so big and delivery could become complicated. So this is what Marbina, who is our advocate, um, had to deal with. She was told about series of issues that are likely to come up. However, she had to walk the work. And now we want to actually understand how she was able to absorb the information that she's received despite the complications and still get to go through it and have even other children. So over to you, Mabina. How were you able to do this? Right. So I was, like I said, when I was diagnosed, I, the first time I was diagnosed, I actually cried because I felt like, what am I going to eat? First of all, it's not easy being pregnant and you know, you have food cravings and all of that. And then you find out that you have gestational diabetes. And so they give you a food you know, plan and you see that you can't eat a whole lot of carbohydrates. And you know, we Africans, we love our rices love and all it. of that. And not any rice, but the jasmine kind, <laughs> the you jasmine know, kind. The one, not the brown <laughs> rice. We like the jasmine, you see. So it was really difficult at first, but um, I realized that, okay, so this is temporary. And so I have to walk that walk just so that my baby can be safe. You know, and as a mother, of course, you put your baby's safety ahead of yours and all of that. So once I knew the dangers that could happen, you know, the threats that the baby could face and all of that, I realized that, okay, I have to take this really seriously. And so I took the food plan and everything that I was given and I, I did my best to follow it. And at that time, I was not in Ghana, so, you know, over there in the U.S., you're, you're required to send in your, um, your sugar levels and all of that. So I had to be checking my blood sugars four times a day, fasting wow. blood sugar, and two hours after breakfast, lunch, dinner. It was not easy. That so was a difficult routine. I had to routine. do it, record it, yes, record it, and, you know, send it over to my doctors weekly, you know, just so they make sure that I was at least falling, you know, falling in, in the line where I need to be. Yes, because other than that, then you have to go into medication, insulin, and all of those things. And so um, that's what I did. And, you know, with the meal plan, I can talk a little bit about it. It's mm -hmm. more or less. So there's this um, system called myplate.org. And so, you know, let's say your plate, whether round or square plate, if you divide it into four, um, two of those, so that's half of the plate should be your vegetables. And a quarter of that should be your protein, so your meat, your fish, and whatnot. And then another quarter should be your carbohydrates, you know. Wow. Yeah, so that that's is so the not opposite African. of how we eat here. <laughs> we have the big bowl of rice and some small stew. No, 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 no. Now you have to switch it. Have the big bowl of, you know, if it's contumbri, have the big bowl of contumbri and just a little bit of rice and all of that, you mm. know. But um, I the first time, it was kind of difficult. But, I, you know, by the time I got to it, my subsequent pregnancies, when they brought me the results and said, okay, you didn't pass, I'm like, okay, fine. Yeah. You know, it's like I become a, a pro a professional mm -hmm, you see mm -hmm. so you know but the main thing about it is um planning and that's what i found that you know don't wait till you get so hungry like if i were to go out shopping or something like that i would plan if i know today i'm going out i'll plan the day before how my meals should be so that breakfast i know what i'll eat and then as i'm going out i pack some snacks or something like that mm. because one thing is when you get really hungry then you whatever you find you want you to grab eat. it yes you want to eat and you know one of the key management tools is exercise activity level and a lot of people you know when they are pregnant you feel lazy and those things but no you need to be active at least walking and that kind of thing so those are all key things that help manage the blood sugar and you know as i'm speaking about this i want anyone who may be going through that to know that even though the first time i was scared that's why I was saying that in hindsight, for my first, my first child, I was borderline. But in hindsight, you know, I almost wish that they had diagnosed me because then I would have not been eating the ice creams and all of that. Mm -hmm. My daughter was big when I gave birth to her, you know. Mm. So it's, it's better to know so that you, you can really manage everything. Yes, I, I think, you know, definitely in hindsight, now when I look back, I'm like, okay, it's much better that your doctors would let you know if that's the situation, than not know and just be eating anything. And then family members and friends will be encouraging you. Oh, you're eating for, for two. two. Eat this, do that, <laughs> this. No, and then next thing you know, when you go into delivery, it becomes a whole different story. story. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I want to believe you picked quite a number of, you know, information from 
the story that Mabina just shared with us. She'll still share more of it, but I'll be moving over to <laughs> Opulent Dietitian to take us through the risk factors. You know, she mentioned that, oh, sometimes because, you know, you're pregnant and family members are always saying stuff like, oh, you can eat this and eat that and you're grabbing as much as you can and you don't even plan your meals, so you grab whatever it is that you see. Let's understand the risk factors. What actually gets people to be diagnosed with this condition? Okay. Um, if, if, if I can ask, uh, mm -hmm. before the pregnancy, what was your, your, your weight? So was it overweight or was it really the normal? I was weight? normal for my second, so my second pregnancy, I was normal okay. weight. Yes, I was okay. normal weight. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's why you were on the borderline. Mm. Is it the second one that you were no, normal? The second, the second one, one. No, the first one was borderline, and that was my first child. So I was really slim. Exactly. Yes. Mm. Yes. My second child, I was a the little baby fat to just get you to me. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, we all understand, exactly. you know. Exactly. So weight is also one of the factors that predisposes, um, and with with the adipose tissue deposition, it also causes insulin resistance, mm -hmm. and because of the hormonal changes, also was which also influences the insulin resistance. So weight is one of the risk factors that predisposes um, pregnant women to this the gestational di di diabetes. And, and as a made mention, if you don't know your, your, if you don't know your status, and uh, you don't know that your diet plays a key role when it comes to um, your health, you tend to eat anything before pregnancy. Mm -hmm. sure. And people assume that Oh, pregnancy is on its own, it comes with its, its own stuff, so I can eat anything and then when I go and the doctor or the dietitian says I should eat this, then I can try and But you wouldn't wait for you to be diagnosed before you start taking precautions. Mm. So you'd have to take your diet. So most of it is a diet that has poor eating habits and poor um, lifestyle. As you made mention, exercise. So mm -hmm. most women especially, we don't exercise. exercise. And so prior to pregnancy, some of these sedentary lifestyles, being active, eating, just some of them do Adidas. Adidas means you eat it's and then sleep. you sleep. <laughs> <laughs> because they are preparing for the baby. Tell that me kind about of mentality. It. Adidas. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's the local terms, okay? Yeah. Not the international Adidas we're talking about here. Yes. Yes. So sedentary lifestyle, lack of exercise, poor eating habits, obesity, and also having histories of uh, diabetes in in your family, mm -hmm. or if you have been diabetic, you have sorry, you have been diagnosed pre-diabetes before pregnancy. It also causes you to gestational diabetes. Mm -hmm. And during most uh, pregnancy, during the first trimester, they, they experience morning sickness. However, some people, some exceptional people, still have their cravings during the first trimester, which they tend to eat sweets. Mm -hmm. So this can also influence. Um, the build-up of the sugar, and some also because of the hormonal changes, as I made mention earlier on, the insulin resistance, mm -hmm. and so and there's no symptom for you to know, unless you go in for the test. That's why it's it's a mandatory test during pregnancy, that's checking your sugar levels and doing the OGTT um, to check or to be to make sure that you are on the borderline or you are on the safe. So there's no symptom. If you're waiting for a symptom to to, to, to let you know that, okay, I now have gestational diabetes. There is no, so there is none, sorry. And so you wouldn't wait and wait for a symptom. You have to just take the step. Since you, 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 you found out that you are pregnant, then now there and then you need to start being on guard. You don't have to wait to be diagnosed mm. um, um, of it. Okay. okay. Yes, yeah. so right. you have to make sure that your weight is in the normal range, your eating habits, uh, as she, she made mention of the healthy plates. That's my plates. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so she had explained that. So the vegetables, we which in Africa, we find problems with our vegetables and fruits. All the time. Mm -hmm. Which mm -hmm. these are high in fiber, which helps in um, uh, uh, glucose control. That is the glycemic, the glycemic index of these foods are lower. The ability of the vegetables and fruits, some fruits, and it's pertains to the quantity anyway. Mm -hmm. But vegetables, especially the fiber-rich foods, their ability to raise the blood sugar level is very low because of the fiber content. That is why we want to plate 50% of it should be fruits and vegetables, but vegetables more than the other place, you mean the uh, carbohydrates and then the proteins the protein. and some healthy fats also be part of your plate. Yes, yeah, so basically. Interesting. You know, quite a number of us that are watching mm -hmm. this show have or, or are engaged in some kind of work. You could be a corporate woman, yes. you could be a businesswoman, and we know how tired we get. 
we come back home and we, we just are not able to, you know, pick anything up. So we find ourselves, maybe we just take our bath and then we sleep. So this sedentary life is something that, you know, over time we practice because in the office we sit down behind our laptops, we hardly move. Mm -hmm. The businesswoman, okay, maybe because she has to move from her chair and go and serve the, the customer, it could at least introduce some kind of movement for her. Yeah. But we have business women also who just sit and then tell the you know the girls to exactly. okay go and attend to the person. So it means you are not moving, so you're not exercising in any way. How were you able to cope or deal with exercise and, and your work? Because you were working during working your pregnancy. So yes. how how were you able to do that? So I made sure that during my lunch breaks I walked around. So after yes. my lunch I wouldn't just continue to be at my desk or be at the cafeteria or anything. I would walk around. Yeah. And even in the office you know, at least if I sit down for an hour, two hours, I would move around, walk yeah. around a little bit so that I don't stay in one place for so long. For so, yeah. long. so that was something that I was very conscious of. And, you know, occasionally if I went somewhere and I, I ate more than I was supposed to, then I knew that I had to walk more. And if it was yeah. a party, then I would be on the dance floor. Because, <laughs> because I had you to had dance to dance it all it out. Off. <laughs> yes. Exactly, exactly. You are smart. <laughs> Wow, yeah. wow, wow, wow. <laughs> well, so for those of us who have not really taken our dance classes seriously, <laughs> I think this should be the time, time. we need to begin exactly. to do stuff like that. Yes. Exactly. Okay. Yes. So tell us, Mabina, what is it you know about, you know, diabetes and gestational diabetes now that you wish you knew about, you know, before this whole episode of getting to hear about it? So that we tell women who are watching us right now that, look, it can be really dangerous. Right. If you know what I, if you know what I had known, uh, I'm sure it's going to be different. So please. Absolutely. Honestly, now with everything that I know about diabetes, I wish that I knew it sooner because I was a fan of sugary drinks. Yeah. That was my thing, and I don't want to mention any labels, but yeah. I had one favorite one wow. with ice and lemon, and it's okay. like I could buy a two liter, and before I knew it, the whole thing it's would be gone. gone. Yeah. Just keep pouring, pouring, pouring. That was my favorite, yeah. and so I feel like all of that led up to you know me developing gestational diabetes yeah. in the future, and then subsequently pre-diabetic and all of that because. With that, um, that much consumption of these sugary drinks, what happens is that you develop insulin resistance, and that's what mm -hmm. she was talking about, yes, because insulin is you know, a hormone that is supposed to allow the sugar in your blood to enter your cells. It's like a key. It works like a key to open up your cells so that the glucose, so when you eat like carbohydrates or drink these sugary drinks and all of that, it changes to you know, glucose in your blood, in your bloodstream. And the insulin, which is released by your pancreas, is supposed to open up your cells mm -hmm. so that the glucose can go in and give you energy. But as you keep taking more and more of these sugary drinks, what happens is that you, your body gets overwhelmed and the insulin now doesn't work properly. And you can develop type 2 diabetes or be predisposed to any other type of, you know, so like if you're a woman and you go into pregnancy, all these factors. It's like you're building up an account mm. and one day, you're gonna you have to have pay the taskmaster will ask you about it. <laughs> you see, you so yes, it, yes, exactly. So you know, if I knew what I know now, then I would not, you know, I would be cautious. But yes. at that time, you know, you're young and you feel like you can just drink anything. And I yeah. tell my daughters now, like you know, uh -uh, tone down, easy, tone down, you know, that kind of thing. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so now, for me. I don't take sugary drinks. And I actually, when I was pregnant, that's when I was introduced to Splenda, okay. the, you know, sweet nut, so that at, at least I could still eat foods and they would taste sweet because I would use the Splenda in, in, in place of sugar. Exactly. And because Splenda is zero calories, it has no impact on my blood sugar. Yep. So at least you can still enjoy your meals without having all that sugar in your system. And so for now, even up to now, I don't take sugar Me anymore. Sugar. Mm -hmm. Oh. <laughs> I like the fact that you mentioned the sweetener, that's Splenda. We'll yeah. go for a quick commercial break. When we come back, we're going to be discussing sweetness. But before we go on that break, I also would want you to speak to the sugary drinks. Yeah. Because right now, it looks like we are beginning to build up on the account yeah. of our children. Exactly. Because they've resumed school and mm -hmm. almost every day yeah. they're going to school with soda. Yeah. What would you have to say about that? I really encourage parents to continue with the soft drinks. Um, I don't want to mention the brand um, because most of these are carbonated. And even though there's some are made of sweetness, but with the sweetness, we have levels of the sweetness and I'll save some of them are. Uh, with regards to 
um, the Splenda. Personally, I also recommend to uh, di uh, diabetics. And so they are on the safer side. But some of these companies don't use a specific one because they are more expensive. Mm. And this tend to affect the children um, because every day you give to them. Yeah. And so it's a build up. So chronic usage of it in the long term, you wouldn't see the effect of that on the children today. However, in the long term, when they're in the adolescence, in the adulthood, that is when they start to have the side effects of these um, surgeries. So I recommend fruits are the best. Okay. Fruit juices are the best. Um, try and blend and fill the bottles and use that and try to encourage the children to start with the fruits and the fruit juices. And those are, they are also rich in fiber, minerals and vitamins. In as much as they are enjoying it, the sweetness, because that's what the children are interested in, mm -hmm. they're also benefiting with the uh, the minerals and vitamins even though some of the companies um write on their labels that they fortify some of, mm. but not totally true and the sodas that we made mention the sodas are not so healthy for this trip because they need a new trend to grow mm. not any other additives and preservatives which also intend to put pressure on the kidneys and the livers for elimination and um, these kids um hardly do we detoxify these kids and so you need to give them the fruits have the natural sources to help them with the growth and development. So I will encourage parents, parents out there to give their children food for their snacks as they resume school. Yeah. Great. You know, sometimes parents go and they say, oh, you know, they play, they're so active, so don't worry. Even if they consume sodas, no. they'll play it all off, so there's no problem. Does that really no. work? No, no. And, and with these sodas, now uh, childhood obesity is even on the increase. Yeah. Yeah. And so childhood okay. diabetes, that's a type well. 1 diabetes, and it's as a result of these soft drinks, the high consumption of these soft drinks. And not all the kids are that active. Mm -hmm. and, and so, as you made mention, this uh, higher consumption will also affect the also insulin production. And for the fact that it becomes resistant at that younger age, they tend to develop type 1 diabetes. diabetes. Yes, okay. so they should be cautious of their health as well, not only with their weights, however, if they also develop diabetes at that younger age, it's not a, a good experience to carry throughout their imagine. lifetime. Yeah. I can imagine. Yeah. So we go for this very quick commercial break. When we return, we get to talk about sweetness. I'm sure those of you who are watching are wondering, okay, so if I have to fill my plate with all those vegetables, hi, am I going to enjoy my cocoa? How would I enjoy it? Well, we'll let you know right after this. You're welcome back to ETV Ghana's African Women's Voices Show. And if you're just joining us, well, you're quite late. But no worries. We are streaming live on Facebook. Once the show is done, you can always go back and watch us once again. Before we went on the break, we said we we're going to talk about sweetness and uh, how safe they, they, they are. So, dietitian, tell us, are uh, sweetness, you know, safe for individuals, whether you're diabetic or even like somebody who is not yet diabetic? You've not been told that you have it. Yes, yeah, sweetness are safe. There are some types of sweetness. Um, when it comes to brands, as she made mention, Splendor, you also have Stevia. And these are extracts from plants, okay? And there are zero calories. Zero calories means there's no calories that can later be uh, converted into fats, which at the end of the day make you obese to affect your insulin production or insulin way of it regulating the sugars. So sweetness, not in general but particular ones that are on the safer side because mm. we have some that are sh um, sugar alcohols we have some that also have some other sugar to it which also affect the sugar level mm. and so if you are going for sweetness you should go in for the brands that are safer that has gone through the research that has been declared safe and has been used by millions of people mm. and then there hadn't, hadn't been any complications afterwards. Okay. And so sweetness are safe, but it's in quotes. 
And if you're yeah. getting, if you're getting it, yes, yeah, same, but it's in safe, So you need to code. ensure that you are getting the one that has been actually, you know, um, checked exactly uh, by maybe the FDA's exactly. of various countries, exactly. and the testimonials are showing that exactly. it's really working, exactly. especially in the case of the calories. It really doesn't add anything to your calorie. Not, not at all. Its ability to raise the sugar level, its uh, glycemic index is very low. So it has no ability to raise the sugar levels. And so there's no other extra calories to build up to add some minerals to gain weight or anything to predispose you. And so not only diabetics can take the sweetness as an you not having a condition, taking it helps to regulate your weight. Mm. And it makes you to enjoy your drinks, it makes you enjoy whatever that taste you're looking for because some of the Sweetness are six. I think we we're discussing six hundred times sweeter than the table sugar, and so having that, you just you only need a little, a little of it. Um, compared to the table sugar, you need a lot of it, which also has calories that will be, that that built up affects your your health. And so sweetness, as we, we are discussing, the type of sweetener you're going for is very very important, and they are on the safer side. That's you are going for the brand that is safe. In yeah. other words. For people who don't actually have diabetes, yeah. it's safe for you to decide exactly. that, okay, I'm going to stop on the sugar. Because sometimes we tell ourselves, okay, we're not taking the white sugar, we're taking the, the, the brown sugar. They're, they're all sugar. sugar. They're all sugar. <laughs> they're all honey. They're, they're all sweetness, sugar. Sweetness are preferable, exactly. but you need to be sure of the sweetness that you are actually having to take. And so far, uh, Splendor comes highly recommended across the, the world. Coming over to you, our advocate. <laughs> now, <laughs> what has been your experience with Splenda? Oh, it's been fantastic. Yeah. It's been, in fact, Splenda is the reason why I've been able to manage my blood sugars and stay out of a zone where I probably would, you know, be in like really yeah. big trouble. Um, because when I f was first diagnosed with gestational diabetes, Splenda was recommended to me by my doctors. They were like, okay, so instead of using sugar for your tea and your breakfast, use Splenda. And so I started using Splenda and I realized that, oh, okay, so I'm not missing anything. It's sweeter because I just use a little bit and my food tastes equally sweet. Mm -hmm. And yet afterwards, when I check my blood sugar, there's no impact on my blood glucose mm. level. So that was really helpful to me. And subsequently, through my other pregnancies, I used it. And I'm even using it now, yeah. you know, whereby I make my own drinks because a lot of drinks on the market have a lot of added sugar. Exactly. So at home, I'm able, you know, I can sometimes squeeze lemon, mix it with water, sweeten it with Splenda, and chill it in the fridge. Mm -hmm. Or brew iced tea, green tea, or mm -hmm. even regular, you know, Lipton regular tea, brew it as normal and add the splendor to sweeten it to taste put it in the fridge when it's chilled you you thank me later <laughs> <laughs> <That's> <laughs> right. so what is it your company is doing to ensure that people have got access to credible or reliable kind of sweetness right so we're bringing in splendor we've taken it through ghana's fda already and in fact this i started this um initiative as a personal thing because I realized that I wasn't here on our market. So that's when we went into talks with the manufacturer that this is a market that also needs this product. And that's when the, the conversation started. So Splenda actually is the number one brand in the US, in North America, number one recommended by doctors, dietitians, and all of that. So we brought it here, we've taken it through our FDA, and we're distributing it through all the shops to make sure that whoever needs it, in fact, we want it to be so common that even at the Cocoa, when you go to buy your cocoa, the cocoa you can ask yeah, you whether you well. need, you know, whether you prefer sugar or splendor. Awesome. Because what I found out when I moved to Ghana was that you couldn't find it. And so when you go out there, there are no options for you. If you're someone that is trying to avoid sugar, there are no options for you. And then the option becomes either you eat your food without any sugar, which is bland mm. and tasteless, mm. you know. So I said, no, <laughs> this is something that many more people can actually benefit from. So these are the steps we're taking. We're making sure that, you know, it's everywhere. And then the advocacy and also educating people, creating the awareness and letting people know that you don't have to be diabetic to even, you know, use uh, a sweetener. sweetener like Splenda. You can actually use it as a precautionary, me you know, measure because if you take Splenda, then that calorie buildup that we've been talking about, mm -hmm. at least you, you are, you know, saving yourself some trouble in the future by doing so. So, yeah. All right. Yeah, I think Great. I, I wanted to ask something. I think um, the misconception is if you're diabetic, you can't take fruits. Mm. And that is totally a misconception. Okay. It's regards to the quantity and how frequent you take and 
whether it's overripe or it's moderately ripe. Mm -hmm. So if you are diabetic, because you need a fiber in there, and so you, if you are diabetic, you can take food, but make sure uh, you get your dietitian to let you know the quantities of food you can take and the types of the fruits you can take. That you can also benefit with the minerals and vitamins in there. Not that because in Ghana, if you are diabetic, then they stop taking all fruits all because fruit. they assume that they are sweet and so it will affect their sugars. So we just want, I just want to clear that if you're diabetic, you can still enjoy your food. Just make sure the quantity and then the frequency of how you take it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So Thank one. you, ladies, yes. so much Thank for sharing <laughs> on the show. And uh, people, I'm also happy you were able to join us. Those of you on Facebook, I saw your comments and everything, but because of time, I couldn't read them all. But don't worry, I'm going to respond to them, okay? Thank you so much for joining us. So the repeat broadcast of this show is on Saturday at 9 a.m. Uh, so 9 to 10, you get a chance to watch this again. If you're not able to do that, go on our Facebook page or our YouTube page. We would ensure that you have it there and then for you to be able to share it and let more people get to know about the safer ways of managing uh, diabetes for yourself or for your loved ones okay so until we meet next week to enjoy the rest of our interesting lineup for you bye bye